I love solid ground. Solid ground is such a blessing. And, you know, to me, parachuting is a great metaphor for living a life full of truth and grace. Um, life is going along just fine, so you think, and you become aware of the truth that you are a sinner and that that's a reality in your life. And that, that realization is, is like being thrown out of a perfectly good plane without having a parachute packed. When suddenly you feel something on your back and you realize that somebody put a parachute on your back to begin with. And when you pull the string and open it, suddenly you're hit not with relief, but with a new wave of terror because you discover there was nothing in the parachute pack. There was nothing there. And then out of nowhere, you see this guy bolting through the sky as you plummet down, uh, down to earth. He comes and grabs hold of you and, and he attaches himself to and he pulls his ripcord and then you feel the relief of drifting safely to the solid ground below. And that is a profound experience of God's grace. And when you finally land on beautiful, solid ground, you say to yourself, self, this is for you. Solid ground is something that we can count on. This is where I belong. And so we build a life uh, built on the foundations of both grace and truth. Both are necessary. And without the fullness of grace to catch me like a parachute, I never get to discover how powerful and important and good solid ground of truth really is. We need both. Let's pray. Dear God, as we enter into uh, a new message in this sermon series on balancing truth and grace today, come alongside us and help us be open and available to hearing you speak into our lives in fresh and wonderful ways. God, I pray that each person here will receive the message that you need them to hear regardless of the words that come out of my mouth. And God, help me get out of the way so you can come and truly be the way, the truth, and the life in the hearers who are gathered here this day, in Jesus' name. And we all agreed and said, amen. Last week, um, as I was stuck in a police car, um, you may remember that. That was, that was not real. I was at family camp with the rest of the church. But anyway, um, last week, Dan preached a really good message, and he talked about how important worldview was. And uh, our view of the world really matters. It changes things. Uh, worldview is the lens through which we see life and through which we, we live our lives, what we do. Um, and the lens that we look through determines how and what we see. Um, looking through the wrong lens, for instance, will distort the view that you have of life, and it will affect the way that you can possibly move forward with your life. For example, um, in the modern worldview, um, part of what we talked about last week was, was as, as a full-blown philosophy, okay, the modern worldview says that, that God is no longer necessary for us to be able to discern and discover truth. Reason alone is enough. And if you want to, if you look at your yellow handout here in your bulletin, it, it kind of shows that, that, that. Now, what I want to say, too, is that we walk through these different worldviews. Um, every time we try and capture these in one sentence, I mean, obviously, it doesn't do it justice. Um, it's wrong in and of itself, but we have to do it. We have to characterize them without making them caricatures, okay? But the modern worldview says that the bottom line is that reason trumps everything else. Reason is number one. Reason alone is, is how we can achieve actual truth. The postmodern uh, viewpoint in terms of worldview um, was actually, actually arose in response to the spiritual death that kind of the modern movement gave rise to. Because it said that, you know, if that, we don't need anything, then that's a problem. And, and so instead of going back to the whole idea of universal, unchanging uh, truth, uh, the postmodern view went back to this, went, went, grabbed a hold of a new idea that said, well, what can be truth for me might not be truth for you. So all truth then is relative. And in the postmodern worldview, experience trumps everything else. Like what I, whereas reason says, I know this because I've discerned it, I've discovered it through scientific discovery, th this way would say, the postmodern worldview says, I feel 
Because I experienced this, and experience trumps everything else that we might be able to, to have on the list. Now, you could even be a postmodern Christ follower if you said, well, my experience is more important than everything else. In other words, my experience trumps Scripture, reason, and tradition. Now, you may hold on to those if it suits you, if it helps you be comfortable, okay? Now, in a scriptural worldview, what we would say is Scripture trumps all. We look primarily to God's Word to discern and understand the universal, unchanging truth uh, for, from God's Word. And, and that's an important place to start. Now, informed in that, it, this is called the Wesleyan quadrilateral. It's something that's been a part of the Methodist Church for a long time. We say that, that Scripture trumps everything else, but we allow our reason to speak into that. We allow our, the traditions of the past to speak into that, and we also allow our experience. For instance, um, we have to have a genuine uh, experience with Jesus Christ to have a living relationship with him, okay? But the living experience that we have never counters the reality of God's word. It's always, it always points us back to the reality. The relationship points us back to the truth and the value um, of God's word for us. And that's huge. That's important. Um, in other words, like... Um, the postmodern worldview says um, there's lots of different ways and perspectives that, that may well be true. Scriptural worldview says, no, there's, 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 there's sort of a, there's a way to kind of encounter truth, and it's through the living God. Um, the solid ground upon which a postmodern worldview would land um, is just to say, you know what? Everything's relative. Whatever works for you is fine. No path is better than any other. Um, truth is whatever feels true to you. All right, so that's, um, that's sort of like kind of putting those things back together again. The scriptural worldview values the big picture truth and the reality that, that yes, reason and feeling are important, but underneath and, and built upon the foundation of, of God's wonderful and powerful word for our lives. Um, and it's how we put information together. Um, so now in a modern worldview, with the focus being on reason without God, the postmodern view being all principles are simply preferences and only preferences. And like I said, that's way oversimplified. But the reality is the scriptural worldview says, nope, there is, there is behind all of our wonderments and imperfections and the way that we don't get it right, there is, a, there is an absolute, certain, universal, and unchanging truth in God through Jesus Christ. And, and that's, that's what we hold up, um, and that's what we, we lift up and say, this is, this is really huge. And um, the fact is that we are engaged in a spiritual battle of ideas. And as we engage in a spiritual battle of ideas in our culture, who's our enemy? No people are ever our enemy as Christ followers. That doesn't mean that philosophical kind of systems aren't our enemies to do battle with, um, but we have to figure out the right ways to do that, okay? Because the reality is, you and I, as those who are called to, to balance truth and grace, we live that out by loving God and loving people um, in a way that helps them see the truth of Jesus Christ. That, so that's important. And the first century Christ followers, um, they knew that they were engaged in the same kind of spiritual battle. They were engaged for the hearts and minds of the people that were in their sphere of influence. And they knew that, that love would be required of them. Um, 1 Peter uh, chapter 2, uh, Peter, follower of Jesus Christ uh, early on and, and a leader in the church, um, and, and he had this powerful perspective to kind of point people to. He said... Um, but, but you are the ones chosen by God. Now, that sounds wildly arrogant unless it's absolutely true. Okay, but he says to them, you are the ones whom God has chosen. And, and you know what? You can't believe that you are chosen without stepping into a scriptural worldview, okay? That where there's some belief that truth can be universal, that it can be um, um, powerful and life-changing, 
and, and make a big difference in the way that you see things. All right, he goes on, he says, chosen for the high calling of priestly work, chosen to be a holy people that is set apart, unique, a special um, in God's grace and love. God's instruments to do his work and to speak out for him. Speak out for God. Well, if you're not landing in the truth with grace, then you are being arrogant. He says, to tell Tell others of the night and day difference that he made for you, from nothing to something, from rejected to accepted. And here's the big hook for a scriptural worldview. Peter says, friends, this world is not your home. Now, that's a powerful truth. When we have the worldview that says, oh, yeah, this world is not my home. I'm made for so much more that changes everything, changes all that we do. Okay, so he says, This world is not your home, so don't make yourselves cozy in it. Why? Because our worldview matters. Do we simply say, well, culture, we're just going to go with the flow. Whatever whatever kind of you say, we're going to adapt ourselves to see through the lens of culture. No, why not? Because that's like borrowing someone else's glasses and saying, oh, yeah, I think I'll be able to see perfectly. Uh, No, I mean, we we have to see through the right lenses. If I try and see life through a a postmodern worldview, I'm going to see things in a different way than if I see things through a scriptural worldview, and that's important. He goes on, he says, don't indulge your ego at the expense of your soul. Don't, Don't throw yourself into the wrong worldview. Don't throw yourself into something that's gonna, gonna kind of put you uh, in the wrong light. He says, live an exemplary life among the natives. Among the natives. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Who are the natives? Anyone who currently believes um, that the world is still their home would be a native. Okay? He says, live an exemplary life among the natives so your actions will refute their prejudices. Then they will be won over to the God side and be there to join in the celebration when he arrives. See, in a scriptural view, um, truth is objective. In a cultural view, it's subjective. The power of intelligence and experience alone are enough for me to come up with, with a way to meaningfully construct a truth for my life in the cultural way of thinking. But the scriptural lens helps us see that truth exists outside of us, beyond us. It's more than us. Like, for instance, if I don't believe uh, that Scripture provides truth and grace, it doesn't change the fact that it offers truth and grace. I mean, I, if just the Bible and its truth and a relationship with Christ are not dependent upon what I happen to think of it. Um, that's not the way that works. There's an objective quality to this reality. For example, um, only one-third of the people in the world have both heard of and believe in the Holocaust that killed Jews during World War II. Now, is the truth of the Holocaust dependent upon people having heard of it and then also believing in it? Or would we say that's an objective fact of history that we must have to pay attention to? It's a truth. It just goes with the territory. It's a truth. There's a woman recently, you might have seen it in the news, Um, She seriously believed um, that she was supposed to have been born blind. Now, she was fully sighted. Um, She had had 20-20 vision, um, but there was something inside her that just said, you know, I was supposed to have been born blind. Um, After a number of years of therapy to work on that, she decided that the thing to do was to put drain cleaner in her eyes and make herself blind. And she literally did that. And she was thrilled because now she felt like her, what she felt on the inside and what was on the outside were connected to one another. She was not supposed to be sighted, she believed. And so now she was that, and it felt right to her. Now, we can dismiss this as just a, a very deeply disturbed woman, but in a postmodern worldview, who are we to judge her? I mean, what right do we have to even suggest that, that she is objectively wrong if, if everybody's truth is okay. If what's true for you is not true for me, how can I judge that? I mean, now, now it's interesting. Um, 
If the solid ground to stand on is merely subjective, personal, and up to an individual alone to determine, that woman's not wrong. Okay? In a scriptural worldview, we would say that this woman didn't clearly understand that her body was a temple of the Holy Spirit. We would have invited her into a long-term process to work through the feeling that she had that she was wrong to be cited and to the truth and grace of both physical and spiritual sight. She decided that she would build her life on solid ground that she determined, but it was really sinking sand, and now she's blind. In our book this week, in the chapter, um, Rob Renfro, in Balancing Truth and Grace, um, talks about Moses and the way that, that, that he wants to know who God is and what God's name is. He says this, when, when Moses encountered God in the wilderness, Moses asked God for his name. Moses knew that when he told the Israelites God had sent him to deliver them from bondage, they would want to know which God he was speaking for. Moses wanted to know how to answer them. So he asked God to identify himself by name. God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites. I am has sent me to you. Exodus 3, 14. In identifying himself to Moses, through Moses, to the Israelites, and through Israel to us, God did not say, I am who you want me to be. He did not say, I am who your heart tells you I am, or I will be whoever you want me to be. God is not some, some celestial codependent waiting on us to tell him who he is and what he's supposed to be like or who we want or need him to be. If God is real in and of himself, then God is not dependent upon any kind of faith that I have in him. God is simply who he is in himself. God of the universe, the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of me and of all life is an objective reality apart from my thoughts and my feelings. Now, my thoughts and my feelings matter in terms of building a living relationship with God, but my thoughts and feelings don't determine who God is. That's a scriptural worldview, okay? In, in the culture, all truth is relative, and just because something is true for you doesn't mean that it's true for me. But in the scriptural worldview, we say truth itself is universal. Not that we perfectly understand what that means, but that there is a way that, that there's universal truth in God that's not relative, um, that is objective, and that is unchanging. And we trust that that is real. And that it's not merely for me or merely for you and your truth, but it's for all people in all times and all generations. Okay? And that's a huge, huge difference. Now, that doesn't mean that we, we choose not to respect people who think differently than us. That doesn't mean that we choose to disregard uh, those who disagree with our perspective on truth. Um, we, in fact, have to be okay with those who disagree with us. Why? Because they aren't our enemy, okay? Uh, the worldview itself is the enemy. Um, but we can't be mad at them because we don't share a worldview. For example, um, in the cultural worldview, it would be wildly arrogant um, for Paul to say what he did in the second chapter of Philippians, beginning at verse 8. He said, and being found in human form, he, Jesus himself, humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. We say, that's the truth spoken with grace. It is universal. It is objective. It is an unchanging truth claim. That claim cannot be a little bit true. That claim is not just for me or not just for you. It's for all people in all times throughout all history. And so we have to hold such grace and truth gently and respectfully, but without apology, without compromise, and without running 
away. So this balancing of truth and grace means that we have to refuse to be right in the wrong way. Why? Because we're called to love God and love people. So when we hold to this scriptural worldview without compromise, uh, without running away, we acknowledge. We acknowledge. We hold that with humility because Jesus came in humility, and that's important. See, our worldview matters here and now and there and then in eternity. Our home is not here. That's key in terms of our worldview, and that matters. And we say, oh, thank you, God, for your grace that, that envelops me and comes to me like a, like a guy parachuting and grabbing me up and, and catching me in the midst of my sin and gracefully leading me to the solid ground of your amazing and abundant truth. And that's the good news that we rest in and thank God for. Let's pray. Lord, as, as, we, as we consider um, engaging in battle around these worldviews, help us remember that no one's our enemy. Help us remember that, that we, we are called upon to love you and to love others in the midst of, of those, um, those interesting kind of differences that we have. And, and you're an amazing God, and you can see us through all that. Help us to balance truth and grace and to get that, get that just right. This is so complicated, God. But we don't want to run away from the truth. We don't want to compromise on the truth. We want the truth and the grace to live together and have a full measure of each as you poured a full measure of truth and grace into your son, Jesus Christ, for our sake. Amen.